Good morning. Today we will be discussing calorimetry, which is part of our thermochemistry sequence. Before I begin, I'd like to keep you up to pace of what we have discussed in lecture so far. We have defined what energy is as the capacity to do work or transfer heat. We've also looked at the first law of thermodynamics, which is also known as the law of conservation of energy. We've also defined what the change in internal energy of a system is, and we've also done some calculations about it. We've also looked at PV work, and we've also discussed changes in enthalpy in exothermic and endothermic processes. Now, we know how to calculate for delta U and delta H, but how do we actually measure them? That's what we're going to discuss in our discussion today with calorimetry. Before I move on, most of us have Fitbits or Apple Watches, which do this amazing job of tracking how much calories we burnt exercising. Multiple apps and these devices make these possible. Now, after exercising, or at least for me, I would like to reward myself with some good food to eat. But when we go to a fast food restaurant, we see these calories on menu boards, which make us guilty. It doesn't stop there. We see these calories on food labels as well. And there are even some apps which will nag us all the time. So today we're going to learn how these calories are actually measured. Calorimetry is defined as the measurement of heat flow into or out of a system. How do we actually do this? There's no such way to directly measure heat. There's no such thing as a heatometer, but there is a way in which we can measure temperature and measuring temperature will enable us to relate it to the heat released or absorbed by the system. And basically this is how calorimetry works. We have to define two terms as well, heat capacity, which is the amount of heat required to raise a substance's temperature by one Kelvin or, or one degree centigrade. And we also have specific heat capacity, which is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a gram of a substance by one degree centigrade. We can see that heat capacity and specific heat are related um, with this equation. We also have another equation for specific heat capacity, which relates it with the mass, the change in te uh, temperature, which is final minus initial for the system, and the quantity of heat transferred um, into or out of the system. So as we can see here, heat capacity is dependent on the mass and change in temperature of a system. Think of it as if you are sending a parcel to a friend from out of state. When you have to pay for um, your package, you actually need to know two things. Number one, where does your friend live? And number two, how heavy is your parcel? We can rearrange this equation such that um, we can actually calculate for heat using the heat capacity of a system, the known heat capacity of a system with um, mass and it changes in energy. And we can also use um, heat capacity um, to calculate for heat as well. So let's have a quick problem over here. Um, there are these various metals which are dropped in a water bath and heated at 75 degrees centigrade. All of them have different heat capacities. Um, which one of them will cool um, the fastest after being removed from the 75 degree water bath? So when you look at these specific heat capacity values, these specific heat capacity values mean that for every gram of these metals, we need this much heat to heat up the system by one degree centigrade. Or we have to release this amount of heat to cool down the system by one degree centigrade. So therefore, which of ever of these has the lowest specific heat capacity must mean that it heats the fastest or cools down the fastest. And therefore, the correct answer is this metal must be tantalum. Now let's look at calculating for delta H or change in enthalpy. Changes in enthalpy can be measured using constant pressure calorimeter or popularly known as coffee cup calorimeter. So this means that you can actually do this at home. Coffee cup calorimeters are not sealed and the constant pressure in uh, this case refers to actually the constant pressure from the atmosphere. At home, all you need is a stirrer, a thermometer, and a styrofoam coffee cup. So we have to define our system and surroundings since this is a thermochemistry process. Our system here will be the substance or reaction that we are studying and the surroundings here will be the solution in which the substance or the reaction is in. Constant pressure calorimeters also help us in 
measuring uh, various heats of reactions such as neutralization reactions, ionization reactions, or changes in physical uh, in the physical state of matter such as heat of fusion, heat of vaporization, or heat of reaction. This table here shows um, what particular physical and chemical processes we can use coffee cup calorimeters or constant pressure calorimeters to measure delta H values of. As we can see here, the units for delta H are in kilojoules per mole, meaning that the energy absorbed or absorbed or released by the system in a chemical or physical process is proportional to the quantity of reactants consumed. Let's look at one problem. An unknown piece of metal weighing 50 grams at 90 degrees centigrade is dropped into a calorimeter that contains 200 grams of water. The final temperature of the water is 28.3. What is the metal? So here we have to define our systems and our surroundings first. And we'll say here that our system is our unknown metal and our surroundings is water in the coffee cup calorimeter. We have to define what the initial and final temperatures are of our system and our surroundings. 28.3 degrees centigrade should be the final temperature not only of the water but also of the metal once the two reach thermal equilibrium with each other. We also have the initial temperature of metal provided and the initial temperature of water provided. Now using um, the equation for Q, um, Q is equal to M times the specific heat capacity times change in temperature. We can just plug and chug these values to give us 0 0.08951 joules per gram degree Celsius, which here is close to aluminum. The unknown metal, therefore, must be aluminum. On the other hand, delta U can be measured using a constant volume calorimeter, also known as a bomb calorimeter. Bomb calorimeters are usually used for combustion reactions. For bomb calorimeters, a bomb is placed in a water-filled container with well-insulated walls. After filling the bomb with pure oxygen, the sample is ignited by an electrical spark. The system for bomb calorimetry is the reaction happening within the bomb and the surroundings is the water and all the other components of the calorimeter. In doing calculations for constant volume calorimetry, we have to define the total heat capacity of the calorimeter and we can uh, calculate the heat of combustion of the reaction using this equation over here. And for most cases, Delta U is a good approximation for the change in enthalpy of combustion reactions given that since this process is occurring at constant volume, there is no work done. Let's look at this problem here which asks us to calculate the heat of combustion of a mole of methyl hydrazine. So using the equation we have previously defined earlier and using the changes in temperature defined in this problem as well as the heat capacity of the calorimeter, we get the heat of the reaction to be negative 113.0 kilojoules. Now we are not yet done because again the problem asks us to calculate for the heat of combustion per mole of hydrazine. And using 4 grams of hydrazine, we can convert 4 grams to number of moles of hydrazine in order to get negative 1.3 times 10 to the positive 3 kilojoules per mole of hydrazine in the combustion reaction. So fairly experiment. So now we know how to measure delta H. We know now how to measure delta U. But how about those capital C calories that we see on menu boards and on food labels? Those calories are actually the amount of energy that we store in our body. In other words, food provides us energy to function throughout the day. One capital C calorie is actually equal to one kilocalorie with a small c, which is equal to a thousand calories. Now, one capital C calorie is equal to 4,184 joules, which, uh, if you may remember, is the specific heat capacity for water. So before the 1990s, calories were determined by bomb calorimetry. So foods or a specific amount of food is placed in a bomb calorimeter, and then the heat of combustion of the reaction is determined. However, this leads into gross estimation as there are some components in food which are indigestible, such as fibers. So after the 1990s, um, scientists have begun using the Atwater system, which basically adds up available calories through the energy containing uh, nutrients in each food item. The Atwater system is basically a standard reference table used for carbon ingredients based on energy densities. So for example, um, the combustion of one gram of protein requires four capital C calories. Let's look at one problem involving calories. 
So a 200 pound man decides to add to his exercise routine by walking up three flights of stairs around 45 feet, 20 times per day. He figures out that the work required to increase his potential energy in this way will permit him to eat an extra order of french fries, that sounds like me, at 245 calories without adding to his weight. Is he correct in this assumption, yes or no? So first we have to calculate the potential energy expended by the man and remember that the formula for potential energy is mass times acceleration due to gravity times height. And we have to factor in the mass of the man and acceleration due to gravity. And basically the height of the stairs, which is 45 feet, convert that to meters. And since he do, does this 20 times a day, we'll multiply the whole thing by 20. And we also note that one joule is equal to one kilogram per meter second squared. So therefore, we here find out that the potential energy expended by the man is 244,457 joules, which we can convert to capital C calories to be 58.2 calories. Now he's eating 245 calories of french fries and he's burning 58.2 calories. So he's not really correct in his assumption. In summary, we have discussed that calorimetry is a measurement of heat flow into and out of a system and we have basically discussed today how to measure delta H using coffee cup calorimeters and also how to measure delta U or bomb slash constant volume calorimeters. I would love to see you in the next lecture. Thank you for listening.